San Onofre currently is, is utilizing the operating plant emergency plan, which is designed for a full-scale emergency with an operating reactor. Both reactors were defueled in 2012 and 2013, and we've certified they're permanently defueled. So many elements of the plan that we are under today are no longer applicable. Again, my name is Joe Anderson. I'm the chief of the operator reactor licensing and outreach branch. I have had the opportunity to be at the song site in a number of the inter-jurisdictional planning committee meetings, and I must say that has served as a model uh, on how to engage the various local emergency response and state response agencies. And it's been something we have at least shown as an example for other sites to emulate as far as effectively communicating with their local responders. As you're aware, Part 50 of the NRC regulations provides specific requirements for operating power reactors. Also, Title 10, Section 7232 of the Code of Federal Relations provides emergency preparedness requirements for the independent spent fuel storage installations. However, NRC regulations for emergency preparedness do not distinguish between an operating power reactor and one that is permanently shut down and defueled, specifically the wet storage of fuel in the spent fuel pool. After shutdown, the risks associated with potential accidents are significantly reduced. Again, the term risk, like safety, can be a very personal issue. For the technical review of regulatory changes, the NRC defines risk as probability times consequences in evaluating impacts on public health and safety. Operating reactors are defined by specific design basis accidents. These are postulated events that a nuclear facility must be designed and built to to withstand without losing systems and structures and components required to protect public health and safety. For an operating reactor, these generally involve elevated temperatures and pressures regarding the operation of the reactor, which would no longer be applicable. As such, the consequences of a spent fuel fuel event, spent fuel fuel event, excuse me, do not equate directly to a core damage accident or a large early release as modeled for an operating reactor specifically in regards to accident timing and driving force for a possible release. Those are two important factors. Also, short-lived isotopes such as radioiodine, which are prominent in a core melt accident, are not present after several days for an expense fuel. So there is not the need for the potassium iodide distribution, which is a key element. The elements of concern are still along with isotopes, however. What also distinguishes a spent fuel pool accident resulting in a loss of water inventory from a core damage accident at an operating power reactor is its slow progression, and therefore the period of time available to initiate mitigative actions, and if needed, take protective actions off-site as off-site officials may deem appropriate. We looked at a proposed integrated rulemaking, which came out in the year 2000. It was developed by the staff based on the lessons learned from these exemptions, again, needing to capture the knowledge and establish a regulatory framework for exemptions. Um, at that time, it was informed by UREC 1738, which was undertaken to develop a risk-informed technical basis and kind of the framework for an integrated rulemaking. Unfortunately, right at that time, the events of 9-11 occurred. <coughs> Um, at that point, in order to allow the NRC to respond to the events of 9-11, the staff requested from the commission to withdraw that rulemaking to allow us to refocus our resources. So that rulemaking was not pursued. It was actually withdrawn at that time. A licensee must consider a spent fuel pool accident resulting in a loss of spent fuel pool water inventory from a beyond design basis event. Again, based on the studies we looked at, the only events that would result in this would be one beyond what the plant would be designed for. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> Specifically looking at a zirconium uh, cladding fire. And again, looking at the public, a lot of questions, what is a zirconium cladding fire? Clad, uh, zirconium is what makes up the cladding around the fuel. Um, the zirconium fire may occur as the fuel heats up. Zirconium cladding may reach a point of rapid oxidation with air producing heat or an exothermic reaction. The energy released from this reaction is sustained, could get hot enough to cause a self-sustaining reaction igniting the cladding, in other words, a metal fire. While the risk from a possible zirconium fire scenario is considered low due to the probability or very or highly unlikely, as indicated
indicated by recent studies, the staff considered it prudent to establish reasonable measures in responding to this unlikely scenario, and that's what we're going to discuss in some detail. Due to the slowly evolving nature of the event, the NRC requires a licensee to demonstrate that spent fuel is either not susceptible to a zirconium fire or sufficient time would be available to take mitigated measures and if needed implement off-site protective actions. And we'll talk about what those measures and timing are. Other events we see are spent fuel cap drops, and this is very site specific, uh, depending on the design of the plant, how they would handle lifting the fuel in and out of the various caps. But a lot of plants have within their uh, design criteria caps that would sit on an upper shelf and for a severe earthquake, the potential that it could drop lower in the pool and result in damage to fuel. So that's something specifically looked at the design basis space. Also, we see continued uh, our fuel handling actions, especially with new fuel, still looking at the movement of fuel. In regards to the desert fire scenario, some of the spent fuel pool actions being considered would be the complete loss of spent fuel pool water inventory, and I'll use the term with air cooling. What this is referring to is a complete drain down of the spent fuel pool due to a liner failure. In the most recent study that was done in looking at the severe earthquake was looking at from a structural analysis perspective, how would a spent fuel pool fail? If it were to catastrophic fail, it would likely fail where the pool walls connect with the floor. So this looked at if there were a significant breach within the pool that water would completely drain it was slowly over a period of time out of the pool, leaving the spent fuel pool open to air. So this is looking at credit for simply the air cooling that would occur through natural circulation within the fuel. The most recent study I referred to, New Rate 2131, showed that for, for the scenarios and reference plant studied again, spent fuel is only susceptible to a radiologic release when a few months after fuel is moved from the reactor into the spent fuel pool. After that time, spent fuel is coolable for at least 72 hours. So that's a significant finding. The other spent fuel pool accident that's looked at is basically the loss of normal coolant. Means are maintained to keep that pool cool. For whatever reason, power systems are lost where they lose the ability to cool that pool. That's what was looked at here. The earlier study, NUREC 1738, showed that where spent fuel had decayed at least 60 days, the time available to take action before fuel is uncovered, due to oil off. That's really where inventory is going to be lost. It's going to be sitting there, heating up, and evaporating. There would be at least 100 hours or greater than four days uh, for a BWR, and greater than 145 hours or greater than six days for a PWR before they get down to three feet. The last accident that was looked at from a spent fuel perspective was the complete loss of spent fuel pool water inventory with no air cooling. This is a little more of a complicated scenario. We're assuming blocked airflow from a partially drained down event. In other words, where, where I talked before where the break would occur, water would drain completely from the pool, either slowly or either rapidly. This would be some type of event that would cause a severe puncture to the wall itself that would be at an area that would be slightly above the bottom of the pool. So you'd have a drain down to the lower regions of the pool. It would create, what amounts to is a, a water and a steam mixture or possible physical damage to fuel that would block the channel flowing up between the pools. Well, what is considered a sufficient time to take mitigated measures uh, to remove heat from the spent fuel pool? Uh, precedent has, that has used a minimum of 10 hours. And it's a point that needs to be clarified. What does this 10 hours mean? We're looking at, as, as far as the all, total loss of all cooling scenario, we're looking at the time when all cooling is lost. All right? We're not specifically looking at the initiating event or how long it takes to get to the point where I lose both water and air cooling. We're being very conservative how we look. It may take a number of hours to a number of days, depending on the scenario to get to the point where you lose all cooling. We are looking at or assuming it's immediate and there's at least 10 hours that would be in place before you reach the point where there's a potential ignition point for zirconium, which is around 900 degrees centigrade. 
historically what we've seen in the exemptions that we have on our plate right now and, and in the past, it's normally 15 to 20 months after the plant shuts down. Crossover, uh, emergency planning requirements from an operating reactor, which is focused on response to a variety of emergencies related with uh, an operating reactor itself versus a decommissioning site, which is really focused on the spent fuel pull event. The biggest one, of course, is for an operating reactor. There's a requirement for a formal radiological emergency plan with the emergency planning zone alert notification systems. Under the decommissioning sites, what's currently in place and what's being proposed is they would rely on the comprehensive or all hazards planning currently in place at the state and local. There would not be a separate rep annex that a comprehensive plan required. Considering uh, Elmo Collins' re recent statement about uh, uh, how the NRC uh, failed to look at the uh, steam generator issue uh, in the best way possible, how can you tell me uh, now at this juncture during the decommissioning? Can you tell me what the regulations are? Uh, what does the NRC demand in way of a uh, mitigation plan for an accident with a drug cast? I do not have, I can look at it right now, I do not have details on mitigation for dry cast. I can look that up and get back to you, but I don't want to talk out of hand. Specifically in this exemption, we're looking at the pool, so I don't have a lot of detailed information, but I can look it up and get back because to you. Because we need that answer uh, by October 14th, our meeting on the computer. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll pull together the, and we're going to have a chance on October 14th to talk to the actual mandates about there. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, please. The other grammar. Uh, just if you, if you looked at accidents, uh, but you look at someone deliberately trying to do something and cause damage and cause an incident of more severe than what you're looking at. Where that would be what that would be under physical security, which again is a separate area which we use is. <coughs> is part of support for what we're proposing uh, as far as approval. Secure physical security has to look at a number of areas. Part of it is that to basically come to a conclusion they have high assurance that they can defend those areas of plants that are, 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 are deep for physical protection, in this case, and spend fuel. And, so and that they, wouldn't be specifically looked at in EP okay. emergency planning. And, and later, are you going to talk more about physical security, Jared? <laughs> later on when you do. Just in the, the brief that says okay. that there's agreement to play. Yeah. On, on this page, I'm showing you, uh, you've seen me use this format before. The top is kind of the basis for the emergency plan. Uh, what's down below is probably most important. Uh, it's a plan for run, responding to emergencies. One aspect is minimize damage to property. A more important aspect is off-site response organizations maintaining emergency plans. Uh, to implement off-site measures in the event of the beyond design basis event that, that Joe Anderson has talked about. It also covers how we manage on-site mitigation activities and protect our employees in the, in, in the event uh, of an accident. Covers conditions when we use nuclear fuel is stored in the ISPACY or the independent spent fuel storage or the dry cask system, as well as in the spent fuel pool. And for the few remaining possible events, and this is important, and this is what the exemptions are about. Pre planned off site response measure or pre planned response measures are maintained for on site areas only. The concept here is when the plant has been shut down for a number of months, and you've heard 60 days, you've heard a number of months after that, we've been shut down for over 30 months. The fuel has decayed to the point where the radiological hazard of a release is significantly reduced. The probability of an event is very low. So the concept of a defuel emergency plan is that pre-planned actions are necessary for on-site activities. Communication activities are still necessary to alert on-site and off-site agencies, the NRC, the state, the county, local responders. But pre-planned off-site activities are no longer required because for design basis accidents, there is no uh, there is no design basis accident that results in a release that can affect the off-site public and for the beyond design basis event, which has been described and I'll talk about, there's more than 10 hours to mitigate it to prevent it from occurring. That's the fundamental concept behind the change to the plan. 
But we want to be, again, in the interest of engagement, transparency, be very clear with that and answer questions about that. Uh, we still have to show that we meet the EPA's protective action guidelines at the site boundary. And the beyond design basis accident of the zirconium fire, we have to show that it would not reach the temperature in fewer than 10 hours. And I'll show you what our times are in a minute. So what's the difference? And, and it, it's some somewhat different terminology, but I'll just recap this. In an operating reactor, and the plan we're under today, envisioned accidents that could be very severe, that could happen very quickly with a reactor at full power, result in significant damage to a hot core, a core that had just been operating with a lot of short-lived radioactivity, high energy, high pressure systems, 560 degrees, 2,000 pounds, that if released, there's a lot of driving force to drive it out to the environment. And if all the multiple barriers designed in an operating nuclear plant were to fail, you could drive a significant radiological release which could affect the public. And that's the basis for things that would escalate from notice of an usual event to an alert, to a site area emergency and a general emergency. Those are the four classifications in the operating plan. Just some examples, the, the reactor coolant system, one of the big pipes breaks in half from the reactor at full power. Okay. Plants designed to handle that, the emergency plant would envision things go wrong and go wrong again and you have a, a significant release. I won't try to touch on every one, but significant accidents that can happen to the reactor at power. In a permanently defueled reactor, first of all, the reactors are, are not only out of service, they have been permanently defueled. There is no fuel in the reactors, they no longer can operate. Those systems and most of those accidents that today's plant is based on simply can't happen because there's no fuel in the reactor. What is remaining as a primary risk is associated with nuclear fuel stored in the spent fuel pool. Now there's a couple things to mention. Uh, and, and we talked about, on, on, and we heard on, on the NRC slides about, in the spent fuel pool, we'll talk about a loss of cooling accident. I'll give you some times in a minute. You know, if I went and shut off the normal cooling system, how quickly would it heat up from 85 degrees to 212 and start boiling away? You could have a loss of water or a loss of inventory, slow or rapid. So what does that mean? You could drop something on the fuel. No leakage of water, but if you drop something heavy, I could drop an individual fuel bundle while I'm moving it, that's called a fuel handling accident, or I could tip a cask over. You know, now this is a many ton cask and they average, say, a dozen assemblies. Those are all within the design basis for a defuel decommissioning plant that we need to analyze site specific and show that should that occur, the release does not affect the public. There would not be enough radioactivity release given how old our fuel is or how long our fuels decay to affect the public. Uh, hours risk reduced, spent fuels at atmospheric pressure and low temperature, 85 degrees, the heat source is low, and significant mitigation time. Um, this is really what is a key item for at least folks in, in my community and constituents is, is a complete understanding and to me, this is the heart of it, is why you're asking for the exemptions and ultimately what is the risk of the community at large? Because what, from what you're outlining, it isn't the things are radioactive, it's the dispersal method, how, how it can become, you know, I guess distributed through high pressure or other items like that. And from what, because uh, I read this and I, 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 so on a permanently defueled reactor, it's not that it's any more or less radioactive, although it's half-life, it's just that it's not so, it doesn't have the propensity towards a huge explosive reaction that could drive it into a, a, a larger rate. It's just more dangerous to those on site. Is, is, is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, let, let me rephrase that. The hazard is significantly reduced. First of all, it is significantly less radioactive. All the short-term fission products, they decay very quickly and they are virtually gone. We've been shut down for over 30 months. So, you know, the fuel is significantly less radioactive than it was in January 2012 when we were operating in Unit 3 and we had just shut down Unit 2. So the, the amount of short-term radioactivity, and I don't want to minimize long-term radioactivity is still there and it's important, but it is significantly reduced compared to an operating plant. That's one issue. Secondly, you don't have the energy, the driving force to disperse it quickly into the atmosphere. Think of it that way. Again, an operating reactor at 2,000 pounds at 560 degrees has a lot of energy to drive material out into the environment. A spent fuel pool at atmospheric pressure of 85 degrees has very little energy to, to drive 
yeah, well, in negative pressure and ventilation systems, but even if I don't create a ventilation system, there's very little energy to drive anything out of the building, much less off-site. So, so that's essentially what it is. Is that essentially what's guiding this request, then, just the difference between a defueled and, a, and, a, and an operating reactor? Yes, what, what drives this request is we look at what the hazards are. We start with what's the risk to the public. You know, first and foremost, this is about public health and safety and the risk to the public. With the spectrum of accidents that could occur at power, with the short-lived radioactivity that can be released to power, those two are gone. So what drives the request is let's change the plan, change the requirements to match the hazard that's there today, and focus our efforts and our staffing on that. That's what drives the change in the plan. Mark one containment design, it was this reference plan studied. I had managed two of those plants. That's a very different, older containment system. It's an older spent fuel pool system, not nearly as robust as what we have at San Onofre. So the zirconium fire, I want to spend a little bit of time on this because the bottom line on the design basis events we've talked about, this is the loss of cooling, the loss of inventory, the loss of water. This is the fuel handling accident. This is the cast drop. Those are unique to the fuel pool or the external events or the security threats. We can show that 30 months after shutdown, we meet all the EPA guidelines for protecting the offsite public and we meet the NRC's draft interim staff guidance for what they would consider for exemption. So where does the zirconium fire come in? This was described as a beyond design based event. So you know, the plants are designed, this could occur, so show me that you can protect the fuel, protect the public, et cetera, for a design basis event. So now you postulate a beyond design basis event. Don't know how it may happen, a rapid loss of water, whatever. The limiting beyond design basis event the NRC has told us we need to meet, they've told all the licensees this, is the spent fuel pool is drained. Spent fuel pool is drained, doesn't matter how it happens, doesn't matter how quickly it happens, it's drained. Maybe there's three feet of water in the bottom that prevents air naturally circulating around the fuel assemblies, that's the worst case. So that leads to this question about the zirconium fire. How hot is your fuel? How long have you been shut down? How quickly can you reach that 900 degree centigrade temperature where there's zirconium reaction would occur to start what's called the zirconium fire? It's a serious event, but it's gotta be shown that you've got more than the required time. So it's beyond design basis. Doesn't matter how it occurs. No air cooling's credited. We've gotta show that we've got greater than 10 hours. That's the NRC's guidance. For San Onofre, very specifically, in August 2013, we exceeded the 10 hour requirement, meaning we had 10 hours or more before we would reach the 900 degrees C. So in August of 2013, because neither reactor had operated since January of 2012, the fuel had been decayed long enough, we met that requirement over a year ago. In October 2014, today, in that worst case analysis, we have more than 17 hours to mitigate. So we more than meet the NRC requirement for adequate time to take action to mitigate. Then if I do a more realistic calculation and credit air cooling, realize this worst case analysis with the three foot of water in the pool assumes any heat given off by these fuel assemblies doesn't go anywhere. It just goes all right back into the fuel and heats it up. It's called an adiabatic heat up case. Very conservative, doesn't credit any heat dissipation. If I credit just air circulation, air cooling, Today, our fuel will never reach that temperature. Tom, how difficult is it to put out that zirconium fire? Does that still burn while it's under water? We're talking about preventing in that 10 hour time frame, or in our case, the 17 hour time frame. I'm not no, talking no, about extinguishing it. I'm just, I'm just saying, that if we reach that point where we have to deal with it and use these emergency methods that you're talking about, how easy is it to put out the zirconium fire? Does it burn under water? Gene, the pool's dry. I, the, the scenario was the pool's dry. Okay. I understand that, so we have talked about pool. putting water into the pool. Does that put out the fire? The, to give you a precise answer, I'll have to get back to you on that to get into it's a call to a class D or special fire. I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay. Uh, I, I have a question. Just, just really quickly, you picked the zirconium cladic fire. Is this, in, the, in a spent fuel scenario, is this considered to be the worst case scenario? This is the beyond design yeah. base. Scenario. This is, and, and is this the only one? Is this, you know, is this why you picked this one? Or? This is the limiting one the NRC has identified through their studies that, that were, you know, the, the, the early 2000 studies, the studies that were updated after Fukushima as the limiting beyond design basis event. 
again, we're designed for the design basis events and have to show we have adequate time to avoid the beyond design basis event. And typically, the way the industry has evolved, we started out with design basis events, and then over the years, particularly say after 9-11, we started thinking beyond design basis where your normal systems that you're designed to cope with things are unavailable. We put in what's called V5B, or today is mitigating strategy and license commitments to stage equipment that you could use for beyond design basis events. It's one of these very unlikely things which should it occur, you need to have some equipment pre-staged to cope. But it's not specific in terms of what it might be, so your equipment has got to be portable and flexible. So that's the concept of beyond design basis. That's the concept. That's why there's no definition of how this pool might wind up drained. And when we realize it's in draining, it's there and it heats up. That's why it's considered beyond design basis. So the Interjurisdictional inter Planning Committee, I'm not going to talk a lot, this, a lot about this because Mr. Kircher is going to talk about this in a minute, uh, but, but as Joe Anderson said, this really has been held up as a model for the industry in terms of how a licensee, a utility, should and could cooperate and partner with local authorities to assure adequate public health and safety and emergency planning implementation. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity to, to speak. I took some notes. I'm going to try and ask some questions from them. Um, first of all, Tom, I guess, was the NRC guy. Um, and Tom, the two of you made a really good case for closing the Elbow Canyon and Palo Verde, pointing out all the ways that San Onofre is now safer than it was when it was operating. Well, we knew that. That's why we tried to get you to close it. But we're still not safe. I want to wonder what a beyond design basis accident is. Does it include an airplane strike? Because I don't think you're going to be able to keep water on that pool if there's a 747 sitting on top of it with a bunch of fire going everywhere. When Gene asked uh, what could start a fire, the basic answer was, well, I have to get back to you. Well, what can start a fire? Is a terrorist can start a fire. Uh, an airplane can start a fire. And I think there's a few other things that could start a fire. Uh, NRC, 9-11 happened, and you stopped worrying about decommissioning the reactors. Isn't that backwards? Joe, right? The NRC guy. Uh, 13 years later, you're finally getting to it. Okay, well, let's not, let's not do that again. Right now, we're putting off all of the long-term decisions about uh, spent fuel storage. Uh, are we going to use an interim site or, or what? And let's not put those off. Let's, the BRC accomplished nothing. And we're, we're going to have to do better than that. Um, speaking of, of what happens at uh, mitigation, the IPC, before the plant was closed, a, a variety of us activists went and talked to people involved in emergency planning around the county, around a couple of counties. And to a man, to a woman, to a person, they did not know anything. Every time we tried to ask a simple question, it was always, well, we, you'd have to get, you'd have to talk to either San Onofre about that, where the experts are, or talk to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They didn't know what an alpha particle was, or a beta particle, or anything. So I don't see how the emergency planning people can do their job if they don't understand, the firemen don't understand, what kind of fire they're going to face if there is a fire at a spent fuel pool or in a dry cask. The students at these 10, at the 10 mile limit, 11 mile limit, they don't understand what they're going to face. Well, they, these, have, these people have to all be educated. That's a big task, and I'd like to, I'd like to see that happen. Uh, zirconium burns. It releases hydrogen, which explodes. This stuff is very dangerous, and we need to be, to be careful of it. And that looks like all my notes in 18 seconds. I've never done that before. Thank you very much. Thanks. had a question, or at least a point about a terrorist attack or airplanes. Um, striking the building. Uh, could you just, in terms of where the pools are located for the folks here, could you just talk about that type of uh, incident and is, is the plan prepared for it? Well, first of all, with respect to terrorism, here's where you couple this physical security plan along with the infrastructure the federal government provides in terms of intelligence as well with the emergency plan. So the, the physical security plan is, is designed for a certain threat that the NRC specifies with the device must meet demonstrate that on a regular basis. The buildings are very robust, especially the spent fuel pools. So that there are they are physically well designed, well protected. The elements that protect it or that, that 
are designed to withstand the expected earthquakes in the area also serve as well from a physical security standpoint. So again, very robust, to couple the physical security plan together and that's the protection. Now as you talk about airplane impact, uh, you get into some events that are difficult to predict what may happen. And this is what some of the lessons out of 9-11. So all the nuclear plants in the country post 9-11 were required as part of it. This is some what we alluded to earlier with the mitigating uh, strategies license condition. We all had to put in place equipment and to spread in diverse areas that in the event of something like an airplane impact, okay, that would destroy some of your installed equipment designed to deal with accidents had other equipment that was not affected by the impact that you can mobilize to cope with the accident. Uh, it's difficult to predict how that may proceed, but that's what all the nuclear plants were required to do. We have that equipment and we'll maintain that equipment. That will be a requirement going forward that the NRC can